Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all of creation. Amen. Gathered together this morning, let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and all we have left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. And we ask that you would receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace through the power and promise of Christ Jesus. Our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, you are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, you are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountain top and into our hearts. We ask that you would transform us by your love. We ask that you would transfigure us by your beloved Son, and that you would illumine the whole world with your image. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord who lives and who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. SS 366. SS-366. The SS means ship submersible-366. I don't really know what the 366 means. Let's say that it means it's the 366th submarine to have been built and commissioned by the United States Navy. 
Sounds okay to me, right? SS 366, it bore the name Hawkbill. A hawk's bill is a turtle. The US Navy, in naming SS 366, made a bit of a mistake. They named it the Hawk Bill. It, miss, it missed, uh, misspelled, it did not have that S in the middle. So it's the USS Hawk Bill SS 366. The submarine was built by the Mantawak Shipbuilding Company of Mantawak, Wisconsin, and finished on January 9th, 1944. It was commissioned on May 17th, 1944, and immediately sent to the Great Lakes for training. Sort of concurrent with this uh, building of the SS-366. A man named Ellis Augsburger graduated from high school in Bern, Indiana, and immediately enlisted in the United States Navy. Upon enlistment, he was told that submariners uh, make 50% more pay, and uh, Ellis, always being a pretty adventurous guy, and I think okay with the extra pay, uh, went for it. And he was assigned to the Great Lakes region for training, and set aboard SS-366, the USS misspelling included, Hawkbill. And he became a torpedo mate above the, uh, among the submarine's crew. After training in the Great Lakes, the submarine was sent out through New Orleans, uh, across the Panama Canal, and went for a small period of time into Pearl Harbor, and then entered World War II in the Pacific Theater. It departed Pearl Harbor on August 23rd, 1944, and Ellis was aboard. As part of its trip, as part of its patrol, it went out and uh, was uh, operating off of the Philippines and ended up with two other submarines in the South China Sea when it spotted two Japanese aircraft carriers. Upon spotting these aircraft carriers, Ellis got to work. The aircraft carriers, uh, though, sought to defend themselves. And they sent out from among the carrier group uh, a group of Japanese destroyers to protect it, uh, these carriers from these three attacking submarines, one of them the SS-366 USS Hawkbill with Ellis Augsburger aboard. Now I'd like for you to think about this. I'd like for you to think about 100 feet, okay? Uh, if you're to think about the roof above your head, I think uh, obviously 100 feet is much higher than that. Maybe 100 feet is the distance from where you are to where your car is currently parked. Maybe 100 feet is the distance from where you are to maybe your uh, mailbox. But on that day in 1944, it had turned to October, and it was 1944, on the day that uh, the Hawkbill had spotted these two carriers and engaged them, and had been re-engaged by Japanese destroyers, it settled under the barrage of depth charges from the destroyers, uh, canisters that the, depth, that the destroyers were putting off with fuses to set them to explode, to uh, damage or cripple uh, these submarines. It set the USS Hawkbill in 100 feet of water with these uh, destroyers moving overhead and with uh, depth charges going off. Now, it could be that this story is a little anticlimactic, because obviously I've come to know Ellis, and I've sat with Ellis. I can still picture him with his USS Hawkbill uh, hat with a SS-366 printed on the front, and you and I know what kind of person Ellis Augsburger is. You and I know, and this is sort of anticlimactic, that Ellis went on to uh, be honorably discharged, to marry his wife Myrna, with whom uh, he was to have all sorts of adventures. Ellis was a super adventurous guy. He was also uh, an incredibly kind and faithful and loving and so it's a bit anticlimactic that I'm asking you to think about October 7th, 1944, and 100 feet of water, and what that would be like, because we all know how this turned out. 
But Ellis was so affected by this day and these moments that he's always told this story. He would talk about what it was like to be in that tube of steel under 100 feet of water with explosions going on all around him. I would say that it lowered a great cloud of unknowing ahead of him. He wasn't a very old guy. And here he is, under attack, and with what's going on, and with the possibility of any kind of damage or anything uh, happening around him, a cloud of unknowing would descend upon his life, and whether he was going to have a life after these moments surely uh, came into his mind, and he still talked about this all these years later. Now, over time, uh, the USS Hawkbill would be uh, sold a, a few years after uh, Ellis uh, was discharged uh, to the Netherlands, and it became uh, the, the Netherlands uh, S803, and it was named the Sea Lion, and it eventually would go on to be scrapped, and uh, all of this was in its future. But in the last few weeks, I've been sitting, uh, thinking about Ellis. I've been thinking about his life. Uh, his funeral was held here at St. Stephen in the last couple of weeks. And I've been thinking about him a lot. I've been thinking about his stories, and I've been thinking about his way of life, the way that he was so humble and loving and caring, and what a great guy he was. And I've been thinking about this story that he told uh, about being depth charged on October 7th, 1944, and what it felt like. And I've been thinking about the idea that having faced death as such a young man, and surely he was adventurous before this to have enlisted and be a submariner at all, but to have faced death on that day is the thing that gave him the life and the beauty of personality that he ended up having once he was pulled out of those waters, or once it uh, came to be that he was safe and his life would go on, and his relationship with Myrna would begin after he was done, and he would become an over-the-road truck driver, and he would live so adventurously and so lovingly. Part of me thinks that the reason why he was so free to live that way is because he faced death the way that he did. And part of me thinks the way that he lived this way is that he knew what it was to have this great cloud of unknowing descend over him. Now, it's not a perfect analogy. It doesn't completely fit because uh, a World War II analogy uh, and then trying to stretch it to you and I who are sitting safely in the rooms that we're sitting in, that's a little bit different. It's not a perfect analogy. But what if I were to tell you or maybe to remind you that our lives of faith have been informed by our own submersion underwater? And that, that submersion isn't a hundred feet, it's much less. The bowl in the sanctuary is obviously much shallower than that. But we've been submerged in this, and we've been baptized, and we've died under those waters. And it's Christ that pulled us out. And that cloud of unknowing, that uh, being reminded of death, is, uh, of course, not the same as Ella's story, but is meant to develop in us the same life and the same faithfulness and the same approach that Ellis had. You and I are meant to consider our deaths. Now, this story from the Gospel, the story of Jesus, um, uh, transfiguration, a, a word that sort of means metamorphosis. Uh, it's a story that I call the shining because Jesus lights up so much. Uh, it doesn't completely fit what I'm talking to you about. To me, the idea of the story from Mark 9 and from the other places in the gospel that tells us about the shining of Jesus is a story about God. It's a story about God and who God is. It's about God's presence in our world. It's not really so much about us. 
it's not really a story that we can apply our minds to and understand, and maybe it's a story that's not even meant to be understood. It's maybe just a story that's meant to be appreciated and absorbed and have us understand who God is, and that story doesn't completely fit this story of the USS Hawk Bill, SS-366, and Ellis and how Ellis is sort of an example for you and I. They're not uh, perfectly even or a great analogy, but I have these together in my mind because of that cloud of uncertainty that moved over Ellis. And because of the cloud of uncertainty that is uh, meant to move over us in our baptisms, the cloud of uncertainty that we face in our own way and our own lives, I mean, think about it. Do you have complete control over where it goes from here? Are you uh, where we are right now because you were all ever in control? We're reminded, and to me Ellis is something of an example of this, that in our baptisms we're put before God and uh, told who we are. And this is a bit of a story about God. It's the shining of God, and it's the thing that we can do in the face of that shining, which is all that we can do, and it's dying, and it's being killed to self. And then it's being pulled by God back out of those waters to face the rest of our days. And again, the story is about Jesus, uh, but I'm kind of thinking of Jesus as a model, and Ellis as a model, and how transformation, or transfiguration, or a metamorphosis happens to us. I'm thinking about whether we really hear those words and take them to heart. Clearly, Ellis, uh, above the, uh, aboard the hawk bill, uh, would have to uh, face them in a way that maybe you and I never have. But do we think about it? that a great cloud of unknowing, uh, of things beyond our control, circles all around us, and that all that we are, and that all that we are capable of, is not necessarily understanding, it's maybe nothing more than giving ourselves over to the death that surrounds us, and being pulled from those waters, and trying to live in a way that makes the most of what we have. Maybe the most that we can do is die and be developed, pulled out of the waters to become a people who appreciate. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, there is a rite where they bless grapes. It's called the blessing of grapes, and it has to do with uh, grapes growing and ripening and being used in a a way that nourishes people, but also in a way that is spiritual, because we use this uh, for, uh, you know, the sacrament and that sort of thing. And uh, this uh, blessing of grapes is a observance of metamorphosis and of ripening. And I wonder if this isn't a bit of who we are. People who in our own way face our own cloud of unknowing, and to a reliance upon God and God alone to be pulled out of the water and uh, where death has encompassed us and to be given whatever time we're going to have left. And if our time isn't uh, ripening or uh, becoming a Holy Spirit moving in our lives to help us be a sort of uh, people who follow in the footsteps of Ellis, the people who after our death make the most of what we have and what's possible and we appreciate our relationships and we work to uh, be developed by God and be adventurous and make the most of every day. And I wonder if this isn't who we are when we've been brought out of the waters of our death and faced the great cloud of unknowing and raised again in Christ. I spend time outside quite a bit. Obviously not now because it is way too cold for me, but as the weather warms I'll spend more time outside, and part of that time outside uh, is dependent on the weather, right? So much depends on the weather. 
and often I'm looking at the clouds and I know that I don't control them but the older that I get and the more often I look at them and I draw from experience I am ripened to the place where I am able like you to read the, the clouds to some degree and after we've faced our own deaths and acknowledged who we are this is the opportunity that God offers us. What if our lives aren't about knowing more or understanding everything? What if they're not about taking control of things, but they're simply uh, about sitting and being a part of the moments that God gives us? And what if our lives are nothing more than a death and a great ripening? Maybe our lives are a learning to read the clouds. Maybe it means that we need to be reminded that we're already dead. And maybe we need to hear uh, the stories of how life moves, whether they're Ellis or our own stories. Maybe we need to picture 100 feet so that we can sort of become a part of the story. I need to think of what clothes that have been bleached and that are whiter than even bleached would look like and maybe what they would smell like and what the dazzling whiteness of Jesus would look like and we need to fall into that moment and just enjoy the moment that we have where God is God and we have learned to appreciate it and to die to our own abilities uh, or, or work to try to control and keep and to simply be and to ripen. To me, all of this is a call to appreciate who we've known along the way. It's a call to appreciate the stories of history and the hopes of the future, but to appreciate them in the present. And it's a call to acknowledge that we are the dead ones. And maybe that's a thing that we need to put ourselves in Ellis' shoes to better understand. Because once we've been the dead ones, and once we've been pulled out of those waters, we know that we're free to be ourselves. And we know that instead of uh, spending our time on feeling like we control or understand, I mean, clearly we don't. Our lives are actually uh, covered with this cloud of unknowing. We can just be present and be who we are. And we can hear the voice that speaks in the midst of these clouds. Ellis was pulled out of those waters and lived such a caring and gentle, wonderful and influential life. And I've been thinking about that for weeks. About his love for Myrna and his care for his family and the way that he spent his days and that that was after he had faced this death under the water. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I want you to place yourself there. And I want you to know that your own death has happened in water, and that you too have drowned under water, and that God has pulled you up, and that once dead, you are now free to live as boldly and courageously as Ellis did. The stories don't completely line up. I mean, the story of the SS 366 is not completely uh, compatible with the story of the um, transfiguration of the shining of Jesus. So I appreciate you humoring me and letting me set these two things together. But I hope more than nothing else you heed the call of this. That you hear again that all of our life starts once we acknowledge that we're dead. And that that life is a just being ourselves. It's a sitting in relationship with others and listening to their story. It's a tasting, it's a hearing, it's a feeling. And it's an appreciating of what we have and getting the most out of it. I hope that you're able to in some way die to yourself today and to be set before a dazzling God who pulls you from the waters of your death and in who in pulling you from them gives you moments and days from here to enjoy and to make the most of. 
what if life isn't a great controlling, it's a great ripening, and what if from this moment forward, freed and raised by God, the best thing that we can do is not try to understand or control, but to be ourselves, to enter into the story of others, and to enjoy what we've been given. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Remember to consider the Augsburger family. Remember Dan and Nancy Camber. Remember all those on our prayer list and all those on our heart. And remember where we share God's peace, God's peace is sure to be found for us too. Remember to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.